Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final speaker for the day, Sir Stuart Rose, Chairman of Ocado. David. David, thank you very much indeed. Uh, so I feel a bit like an old fart who shouldn't be here. I'm sort of old technology. Everything I've, everything I've done is in the past, and everything you are about to do or are involved in is all about the future. Um, anyway, it's a miracle that I'm here at all. First of all, it's a miracle I'm here because of the tube strike. Secondly, and I'm amazed you're still here because it's pretty horrible out there, actually. It's a miracle I'm here because I thought I was here tomorrow and you are here today, so that would have been a problem. <laughs> so it's a good thing I'm not an online delivery company because I'd, really, I'd, I'd have really pissed off my customer on that <laughs> before I've even started. Um, I hope you've had a good day. Um, and I probably would have known a little bit more about what you said if I hadn't arrived literally minutes ago. But I've, all, I've, I've understood that you've had a good day because I've understood that you've all understood that we have to start with the customer. Is that right? Anyway, it seems like a good idea. I thought the best one I heard was, and somebody tweeted me this or texted me this this morning saying that Daniel Wallace from Boots, is Daniel Wallace from Boots still here? And he's gone home. He's still there, Daniel. I hear your quote was that we have to design solutions for the future that no one understands. Is that right? <laughs> Well, I couldn't have put it more, you know, more succinctly myself, so uh, possibly we can see how we can get around that one. Um, possibly, though, we can understand about what the future's got a little bit by sometimes informing ourselves about what happened in the, happened in the past, because one thing we all know is we're all involved in some form of retail or distribution or uh, customer service or other, is that the world is constantly moving, and I'll talk about that. But secondly, quite often, you know, new ideas come who've been around before, but they come back in a different iteration. We are operating in a world that's constantly changing and one in which the rate of pace of change is accelerating. And I was just looking at that and a couple of other idle stats last night, thinking in 90, all the papers that were published, scientific papers that were published in 1960, all published in one day in, the, in 2014. All the telephone calls that were made in a year like 1995 are now made in one day in 2014. And of course, we didn't have the mobile phone, we didn't have the personal computer, and we certainly didn't have things like iPad and social media and uh, texting and whatever else. And for many years, of course, that was fine, because uh, what, you didn't know, you didn't, what you didn't know about, you didn't want, and we all survived pretty well, and brands delivered pretty good service. But essentially, for a long, long time, retail and distribution remained unchanged. I mean, one of the things it remained uh, unchanged of, which we're having to really grapple with today, is, of course, it was only designed to go front to, to, you know, left to right, from, from a warehouse to the, to the uh, store or to the consumer, and it's not actually been designed in the past to go backwards. That's something now, of course, we've all got to grapple with because a lot of our customers do want to send things the other way, and if you're not configured to go that way, you can be very, uh, very unprofitable. So essentially, they remained, they remained un, uh, unchanged, but the world kept going around on a faster and faster basis. But essentially, the mantra was for retailers that we buy, th we, we buy things for you, we put them in our shops, and you'll buy them from us because that's all we're going to offer you. But at the same time, of course, been massive changes going on. We've seen massive economic changes. We've seen massive political changes, not just in this country, but worldwide. What's happening in Ukraine, what happened in the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Arab Spring, what's happening here in terms of the fact we have to get used to the fact now, probably going forward on a permanent basis, we'll have a, co a coalition government, and we've never had that before since wartime. We're seeing a huge number of social changes, and of course, we're seeing behavioral changes. And I talk a lot about change quite a lot because I have not by design, actually by accident, been involved in a lot of change in my life, as David pointed out. Businesses that I've gone into where you look at change and find that change is necessary, and yet change is a short word, it's a very innocent word, but it's a word actually that's feared by most people. My experience is that actually for every 20 people you get in a room, only one person likes change and 19 people hate it. That's because we are our creatures of habit. You know, barring the tube strike, you know, we get up every morning at the same time, we have the same shower or bath, we have the same thing to eat, we go to, go to work in the same particular way, we read the same newspaper, we have the same latte or whatever we have in the same coffee shop, get to the office and don't have the same conversation with the same person as we had yesterday. You know, we, we don't like anybody who gets in our way, so getting around that whole process of change is something we're not used to. The trouble is, though, you can't fight it. It is like the clock, it is ever onward. You can try and fight it, you can't ever win it, and it's much better not to be self-defeated or demoralised or, or uh, find it wearing. It's much better 
to be liberated, it's much better to, be, to embrace it, it's much better to be energised by it, and it's much better to actually enjoy that challenge, which can be exhausting, but that challenge of not knowing quite where you've got to go tomorrow, but knowing that tomorrow can be an exciting place. And I was just again reflecting uh, last night on the sort of changes that I've seen in all the time that I've been in retail. And this is nothing new for you, you've probably heard me say this before, one or two of you. And if you go back to the time that I started in retail, we did have traditional butchers, bakers and candlestick makers. There were 100,000 independent butchers in the early 70s in the UK. Well, there's a few now. I think there's lead gates in Notting Hill Gate. They charge about 50 quid for a, for a sirloin steak. But apart from that, there's not many about. Departmental stores. My sister used to work in Marshall and Snellgroves. You had uh, Bourne and Hollingsworth. You had Swan and Edgar. You had old Derry and Toms. You know, half of you guys can't remember these names. They've all largely gone. And, you know, no disrespect to anybody from Debenhams or House of Fraser here. But, you know, it's not as good fun in departmental stores as it used to be. Food supermarkets didn't exist. John Sainsbury claimed that he invented the first one in the UK, brought it over from the States. But you still had the first food supermarket that you walked in. You had those nice tiled long aisles. You had the ladies and the gentlemen on the left and right hand side with their hats on, with their aprons, selling you pork pies or slices of bacon or pieces of cheese. And yet today they dominate because all of them not only sell food on a massive scale with a large market share, but all of them bar one, I think Morrison's, uh, sell everything else as well. They sell clothing and they sell uh, non-foods. Morrison don't yet sell clothing, but I'm sure they will at some point in time. Discounters didn't really exist. Discounters now, what have they got? 30, 35% of the market. You know, that's a huge change. Regional players did exist. Regional players don't exist anymore. International, there was nobody in the UK at that time. I think the last international, or the only international player in clothing, was, uh, was CNA, and I think CNA closed its doors back in the 70s, and then suddenly now you've got tickling clothing, 50 plus competitors. You walk down Oxford Street or you walk down uh, Bond Street and see what's down there. I mean, it's unbelievable in terms of what the customer has got in terms of choice. And of course, no one had heard of e commerce, e tail, omni channel, click and collect, m commerce, s commerce, showrooming, contactless payments, electronic wallets. Uh, or indeed thought of the possibility that we might just have e-tail only businesses like ASOS or Ocado, that's the advert for Ocado by the way, uh, ASOS or Ocado or indeed Amazon. And therefore it's a picture of constant change and nowhere to hide. And then on top of that, this is that acceleration of the rate of pace of change. We're living in this 24-hour real-time world where, you know, if David Beckham does go to a party with Victoria in Los Angeles tonight and does wear a white tie, you'll find somebody in the UK tomorrow who comes into your shop and says, do you sell white ties? It's going to happen. That's how it works. With blogging, with social media, with Facebook and with tweeting. And this change is happening everywhere. This acceleration and change and this change is happening everywhere. It's happening in business. It's happening in leisure, it's happening in politics, it's happening in entertainment, and certainly, as we all know, because that's our business on a day-to-day -day basis, it's happening in retail. And it's driven by essentially three things. It's driven by economics, but it's mainly driven by technology, and that technology then drives those other changes, the social and the demographic changes which we're seeing, and it's driving increased customer demand, which is causing problems for all of us. Now, going back to my career, which you kindly pointed out to me, David, I couldn't remember if I've worked with six businesses, one of them twice, or five businesses, one of them twice, but there or thereabouts. Um, and I started my career at M&S, and I finished at M&S. But at, all, at one time, all of those businesses got into trouble. You think about it, well, that's just quite a big range of business, but they did. They all failed to spot the problems. They all failed to see what was happening. They all failed to listen. They fa all failed to adapt. They all failed, as an old boss used to say to me, to look out of the window every day, and when they did finally look out the window, they find the world had passed them by. And why? Well, I think we all know the reasons why they don't do that. Because it wasn't their problem, because it wasn't their responsibility, because it was too difficult, because it upset the status quo, because it upset their own status quo, because it was too threatening, because it was too uncomfortable, because perhaps, dare I say this, they lack the leadership, they lack the vision, they lack the courage, they lack the insight, and they lack the determination. But I'll tell you a little story. 30 years ago, Lord Seif was the chairman of Marks and Spencer at that time, and uh, I used to be his personal assistant. I remember we used to have a thing called the Bureau of Standards, where we used to go in and look at all the other competitors' stuff on a weekly basis, so we'd have all the Sainsbury's cauliflowers in and the, and, and the Waitrose cauliflower in and everybody else's cauliflower in, and we'd look at them, price of the cauliflower, size of the cauliflower, grade of the cauliflower. And I said, sir, we used to call him sir in those days, it was rather quaint, with a white, tie on, with a white uh, shirt on. Um, sir, um, I just want to point out some product here from Tesco, and he looked at me and said, mm, Tesco's? Oh, you don't want to worry about them, boy. Let's pile it high and sell it cheap. We don't want to worry about that. There'll never be competition. That was about 1979. And look what happened. But ironically, and it's no disrespect to Tesco, for whom I've got a great deal of respect, look what's happened to Tesco themselves now. They've got exactly the same problem going on. 
that they themselves are now finding that somebody's come along and disrupted them. So you've got the Aldis and you've got the Lidls. And these days, you know, if you'd gone to Aldi and you'd gone to Lidl, I'm going to be slightly cheeky now, 10 years ago, you'd have found Aldi-type cars and Lidl-type cars. You go to Aldi and Lidl's car park now, it's full of very expensive cars because people have suddenly woken up to the fact this is a smart and clever place to go to get your lobster or your smoked salmon or your day-to-day -day, um, groceries or your stuff. So the world is constantly moving. And just to digress for a second, there was a very interesting program, which you may have seen on the TV two, three, four, five days ago, about Jeff Bezos and Amazon. Did anybody see it? Well, you know, to me, that was a real eye-opener. But the real, real eye-opener of all of it was that Jeff who I've met a couple of times because uh, um, Amazon used to run the online platform for M&S before we had time to upgrade it, actually was open and honest enough and actually smiled and cracked a joke, I think, at his own expense about the fact that he was always running so fast because he was always looking over his shoulder because he knew perfectly well that somebody would actually catch him up and beat him at some point. And the question was, would he actually retire before he got caught? So if a guy who's running 170 billion pound or whatever his corporation is as hungry and frightened as that, think what hope there is for the rest of us because that is the 800 pound gorilla sitting in the sector. It really is quite interesting what's going on there. Um, so when I started in retail, I was told by the same Marcus Seif actually, that the customer was king. But it was, it was only broadly true and it was broadly true. But actually, we dictated the terms. You know, we did actually buy the stuff that we thought they wanted to buy. We took it in the shops and we said, take it or leave it. Well, that's all gone. And you know that's all gone. You don't need me to come along here at five o'clock in the evening and tell you that's gone. They want now what they want, they want when they want it, they want how they want it, and they want it 24-7. And they don't want it at what price we're prepared to offer it to them at. They want it at the price they're prepared to pay. With the sort of services that they demand, which makes it really hard for us guys, because you know we're all now competing with each other, saying, well, shall we offer free delivery? But look what's happened going back to Tesco's in terms of the price war that's now restarting. Suddenly you found yourself, Tesco's are a bit, a bit hungry, they need some more business, so they've got a price war going on. Morrison's have responded. That's going to have an impact on other people in the online grocery business, going to make it tougher. But at the same time, you know, they're offering free slots for delivery. At the same time, they're offering free returns. Well, that's a sort of nil-sum game. Now, the customer doesn't give a bugger, excuse my friends, ladies, because customers are actually having a great time, because the customer's getting what they want, how they want, and when they want it, but we're going to go bust. And we're going to go bust because what you have to worry about is that there are now sort of two or three different types of retailers, but the ones that we need to worry about are the Amazons of this world, which I talked about. And I was just thinking, again, last night, about my own shopping habits. I've spent all my life in retail. So, you know, it was pretty obvious that I would like, to, I mean, I do actually like clothes. I'm interested in textiles. I've always been quite interested in fashion. I have not been into a shop to buy any clothes for about six months. I haven't been to buy any food for three weeks. But I have bought some shoes online in the last two weeks. I bought some chocolate via Amazon because I wanted the lint 99% chocolate. I bought some glasses, some, some vodka shot glasses, which I got online from John Lewis's. I bought some seeds from the seed shop, which came online. I bought some books from Amazon. I'm a big book reader and I would always go to a bookshop. I hardly ever go to a bookshop anymore, I'm rather sorry to say, because if I want a book before six o'clock tonight and I've got an Amazon gold card or whatever I pay 20 quid a year for, and I order the book, I'll get it by tomorrow morning, seven o'clock, and I'll get it at 50% of the retail price that I will pay if I go to, uh, to Dawn's bookshop in Fulham Road. It's quite tough, isn't it? And at the same time, I've also bought a birdhouse. For my duck, I bought a duck pond thing. And that was delivered by Amazon online, came the following day. It's fantastic. That's really quite, I never thought myself I'd be finding myself that behavioural change. I mean, clearly when I was chief executive of M&S, I would do that and I would go shopping there, but now since I've left there, my loyalties have changed. So there is no customer loyalty. When I was born, uh, when I was young, my mum was a Sainsbury's customer and she was a Marks and Spencer customer. And you'd never get her to go anywhere else. No, they don't, give, they don't give a bugger. They'll go because we have got full price transparency, because they've got optional, we've got a huge number of options, they'll go where they want to go. So we have to keep our eye on every trend, we have to keep our eye on every demographic change, on every behavioural change, on every technological change. We need to adapt, we need to innovate, we need to say, do one other thing, of course, and this is the one that we need to, I think, do more of. We need to collaborate. And I can remember, and you've all been there, you know, at the time when I was a chief executive in the latter part of my career, you'd sort of ring up your competitors and suggest that some of the retailers collaborate on doing X or Y or Z. Over your dead body, you know? Whether it was carrier bags, whether it was anything to do with anything, you could never get four people in a room to give you, the, you know, a, a consensus view about anything because we're all in competition with each other. But actually, 
If we're not careful now, we're going to find that nobody's in competition with each other because some of us aren't going to be here. So I think we need to think about that because look what's happening in the sector. I'm chairman of Ocado. Ocado makes no money. Amazon made no money for donkey's years. ASOS makes a bit of money. Right? I've got a shareholder in Ocado who's a big shareholder in Ocado and I went to see him the other day and he said to me, Stuart, just to make one thing quite clear to me, I'm not remotely interested in profit before tax. I'm not remotely interested in earnings per share. He said, I'm interested in share. He said, I'm interested in market share. And I want you to go and build that business and reinvest every penny you've got in that business back into the business and build absolutely huge market share. Then I want you to dig a moat around it. Then I want you to fill the moat with crocodiles. And then I want to see him wait, wait and see what happens. <laughs> That's what Jeff Bezos did in Amazon. Now, for me, that's really, really important conversation, right? Look what's happening outside. Understand what the disruptors are doing. And they are disruptors, Amazon. ASOS is a disruptor. Ocado is a disruptor. And that's not a bad thing because it's good for the consumer. But it does mean for those of you, many of you people here have got good businesses. But how are you going to remain financially viable? Well, clearly the thing I was first taught when I went into retail, product, product, product. You've got decent product and decent service and a decent environment or a decent, a decent service in terms of your service metrics on online. You can make money. But the thing that I think is really important now is got to harness the technology, which is ever-changing. I mean, what is the most powerful tool that is around today that I used to go when I was chairman of Mobile Money Network? This was a startup mobile money network business, and I was chairman of that back three years ago, and I went to see every chief executive that you could name the name of and talk to them about payments on that. And they all laughed at me, right? The tablet or the mobile phone now represents 40% plus of all transactions in, in Ocado, right? It's a marvellous piece of, piece of kit, but it's the same for everybody. You know, you can actually now do a huge amount of this. They call it a telephone. It's not a telephone at all. Nobody ever talks on it, right? <laughs> we tweet on it, we text on it, we FaceTime on it, we actually talk on it. So it's a complete misnomer. It's the most powerful thing out there. So we've got to understand the importance of this stuff. We've got to understand the importance of big data. We've got to understand the importance of m-commerce. We've got to understand the importance of s-commerce. We've got to collaborate with the technical providers out there. We've got to collaborate with the web companies. We've got to collaborate with the mobile companies, with the banks. We've got to have contactless payment. We've got to have added value eco-securities. We've got to have better functionality with convenience. We've got to have it really, really now rapidly. We've got to integrate that with speed. But we've also got to be prepared to share and collaborate. And that going back to that word again. In two ways, or three ways, we've got to share and collaborate technically, but share and collaborate as businesses because there is another collaboration going on, which people might have scoffed at even a year or two ago, and I'm not doing this as an advert for Ocado, but Ocado and Morrison's are collaborating. No disrespect, they were clever enough at Morrison's to recognise that they had to get into online. They were equally clever to recognise they couldn't do it themselves in a, in a measurable time frame. They were equally clever to probably say they couldn't do it to the scale and, and, the, and, and the quality level that they wanted. So they were smart and went to somebody else. And we did provide that and we delivered our first van a week early. But we also have a, a similar sort of arrangement with Waitrose. That's another collaboration. Might be slightly, but it's the same. <coughs> Waitrose are collaborating with, 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 with Ocado, and I think the relationship has got to a stage now where it's a one plus one equals more than two. So that's another one that's going on. You know, why not, if you've got these vans going around delivering your products, use that van which is all right, going all the way to my house in the cottage in Suffolk delivering stuff with some empty space in it, why can't it put some other thing? Why can't it put the bird box in with the Ocado delivery? Why can't you have a situation in Marks and Spencer in Western Supermare where there's been a store for 107 years and there's three or 400,000 people in a population area there which are badly served by Marks and Spencer because it's too light for heavy work and too heavy for light work. So it's got a, a quite good food section, but it hasn't got everything you might want. And it's got a crap textile section that hasn't got anything you want. Right? So why not say to yourself, actually what we're going to do is reduce the textile offer to the narrowest range of textiles that you possibly want, i.e. the tights that the lady might want and the knickers and the men's t-shirt and the kids' socks or whatever else and say, that's always going to be in stock. It's in Western Supermare if you need it tonight for your son to go to school tomorrow, fine. But why don't you also have the technology and the enablement in there for people to go in by six o'clock with the most fantastic technology subject to availability. You can order any item from the Marks & Spencer catalogue which is available in Marks & Spencer Marble Arch and have that delivered to Western and Supermare the following morning. At the same time as giving the rest of the space to an absolutely fantastic food section which has got everything in it, then you'll still have some space left and what do you do then? You say to Mr. Amazon, would you like to have a click and collect point here or to somebody else or to somebody else because that then becomes the new community centre. Because I constantly get asked, and I was on the board of a retail, of a property company for 
10 years, Land Security is the biggest property company in the UK, which has got a third of its portfolio, billion and a half pound in retail estates. So they used to say to me, Stuart, what's going to happen with bricks and mortar? Well, the answer is, if I'd known, I'd have gone off and done it myself. But I didn't know. And the answer is, it's not going to disappear, but it is going to change. And it's going to change, I think, in a long way through collaboration. So we've got to think about collaboration. We've got to think about what's going to happen if we don't collaborate. We've got to think about what the ASOS is and the Jeff Bezos is and the other people are going to do. And you've got to think about, if you're in business, there's no point in you being in business, in being in business to make no money. I mean, it's, you know, it's quite fun going to work, but it ain't fun going to work and making nothing. So think about how you do that, and I think collaboration is one way. Remember, as I said earlier, the customer is less loyal, the customer is more demanding, the customer is certainly richer. We've had the biggest recession for the last 50 years, biggest recession since time began, right? Trust me, people are richer, they're more demanding, they're less, they're, 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 they're cash rich relatively, they're time poor relatively, they want what they want, when they want what, how they want it, as I said to you earlier. So you've got to invest in intellectual capital, You've got to invest in human capital. You've got to invest in financial capital. You've got to invest in your imagination. You've got to be two words, which I think, if I leave you with this afternoon before I hand myself over to Kate over there, who's going to grill me about something, um, you need to have restless dissatisfaction. And that's quite tiring. To be restlessly dissatisfied means that you do what you do today, you work yourself hard, and then come tomorrow morning, you beat yourself up again, start all over again. And if you don't, I trust, you, some, trust me, somebody else will, and when you look out of the window, you'll find that the world has indeed passed you by. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for that, uh, Sir Stuart. That was uh, fantastic. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, partly introduced by Sir Stuart, but uh, Kate Pearson, head of Stratit John Lewis. Um, she's got a few more questions uh, to pose for Sir Stuart on our behalf, so uh, I'll hand over to you. Hello, and um, thank you, Sir Stuart, for your thought-provoking address. Stop calling me Sir, right? Stuart, I'm Stuart to everybody. The only good thing about being a knight is I get a table in a restaurant, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to explore some of the areas that Stuart was talking about in a bit more detail, but if anyone's got any questions as we go through, please stick up your hand and someone will run over with a mic um, and we will pick it up at some point. So firstly, you said it's all about the customer. How critical do you think delivery is in customers' purchase experience? Well, I knew you were going to ask me this, and I was thinking about it today. And I don't know if you'll agree with this and whether I'm even right. But interestingly enough, I think I've got more tolerance. I mean, customer delivery is important, mm. and you do want most of it to arrive most of the time that you thought it was going to come. But I am more tolerant of a delivery being late for two th if two things happen. Mm. One is I get told, just keep me informed. Tell me it's going to be late, right? Yeah. And the second thing is, therefore, that I can plan what I'm going to do. But I am more tolerant of that than I am of going into a shop to buy something to find when I get there it isn't there. Mm. So I don't, I'm, you know, maybe I can use my time more effectively if it's delayed. But actually having done the trip to the shop to go and get something, find it ain't there, that's really bad news. This is less bad news. Yeah. So but do you talk think, to me. Do you think retailers should therefore focus on the reliability yeah. of the delivery proposition rather than it being the fastest speed, the lowest price? Reliability for me, and listen, this is generally not an ad for Ocado, but we've got a particular business model in Ocado. In truth, and this is a closed shop, there's no press here, I don't want to read about this in the paper tomorrow morning. If you put £5 in an envelope, I can't tell you whether Ocado will be a £20 stock in five years' time or it will go bust. Right? Now, it's been going 10 years and it hasn't made a bean. But what I do know is that we have invested a huge amount of intellectual, financial and human capital into doing what you just suggested, which is offering the, or being the only provider in town who can deliver the best metrics on delivering to an individual um, postcode within an hourly time slot and pretty well guarantee it'll arrive. That's, I, I, that is really important investment. And I urge you all, if you're going to have any metric to measure yourself on, measure yourself on that sort of metric. Okay. And what do you think uh, is the biggest challenge for retailers then in meeting those criteria, the things that customers want? Is it about the technology barriers or is it about the e economic challenges which you also talked about? Well, I, I, I sometimes one wish, and I sometimes wish I wasn't, still in charge of a retail business myself. It's quite difficult. Mm. And I have to ask myself, I mean, there's a lot going on at the minute, and you know this better than I do, and so do you uh, guys out there who are actually operating businesses. But I mean, every time I open a piece of paper or look at something or read about something, somebody's giving away something for nothing. That is a nil-sum game. Right? You've got to find a way that you're going to make me pay for your service. And I think that word, which I hate, or a holistic word, is right, that you've got to give me, within your brand, 
the comfort that I can do what I want and how I want it, and by and large get pretty well you know, it right most of the time, and then I can start or continue to charge a premium or continue to make a margin from it. If not, and you just become like everybody else, you'll all end up just going to the lowest common denominator. And that's, that's a real problem. So building a brand, so part of that is exclusivity of your product. Part of that is exclusivity of service. Part of that is excellence of service. Price is important, but I don't think price is absolutely the driving thing. I think people, I don't know, you ask, ask you at the table, I think people are more likely to pay for value, which is a function of price times quality, than just price alone. So would you have best price and shit value, excuse my French lady, or would you have value, which is good price and, 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 and good service? I think you'd go for the latter, mostly as a consumer. Mm, definitely. Um, so looking ahead, you talked a lot about it being a fast-moving environment. What key innovations do you see happening in this space in the next few years? Well, I think it was summed up by Daniel over there. Nobody knows. <laughs> I think what, one thing that is definitely going to happen is just take online. Yeah. You know, I had a conversation with Google 78 years ago at Marks & Spencer. And I remember asking them what percentage they thought would go online by 2020, and they said 25% will be the minimum. Well, you can see stats now. We say 40%, and you can see stats. We do have some of the highest, I think, the highest penetration of online in the, in, in the world, outside yes. the States, or certainly possibly even in the world. We are, we, are, we are good online shoppers here. But it is going to happen. This is not a question of when. This, this is not a question of if. This is a question of when. The thing we can't predict is the timeline. What you can definitely predict is that it's going to go, and when trends happen, whether it's a fashion trend or a food trend, or in this case, a, uh, a channel trend, they will go just like that. So be prepared. You know, you want to build that capacity. And I'm involved with a few businesses who are effectively you know, bricks-only businesses, or where until recently bricks-only businesses, and I urge you, that ain't going to last. What about things like drones? Do you think we'll ever see them off rotating? Well, there was a nice know? picture of a drone on this programme the other night about Jeff Bezos. For God's sake, I hope not. I mean, I <laughs> shoot them down. <laughs> so shoot them down. Be great fun, see what you get. It? You could do sort of paint shooting and that sort of stuff. Shoot the drone. <laughs> but I can see, going back to my point, which I may not have articulated as clearly as I'd liked, um, a lot more consolidation. I can see people waking up, retailers waking up, brand leaders waking up, chief executives waking up and saying, well, actually, we've got this cube mm. and it's moving around all over the place. Just how can we fill this cube? And if I can't fill it with the product that I can sell you, because either I don't sell the product or they want something else, fine, don't be too proud, fill the cube. Because mm. that is service for the customer, that is convenience for the customer, and that's pound notes in your margin. Yeah. So I think Absolutely. we should think that way a lot more. Mm. Mm. So I urge those of you who are tomorrow's chief executives, don't be afraid of collaborating with your competitors. Um, on the subject of the last mile, in a slightly more conventional way, uh, what do you see the future of the carrier market as? Do you think there'll be some consolidation there? I think there has to be. I mean, you know, I, I think there has to be. I mean, we have this debate a lot about, you know, how's that last mile going to develop in Ocado? Mm. And the answer is, and I just, I, I don't know, but I think there will have to be some consolidation, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what about the rising level of online returns? I think that's something that's been talked about already today. Uh, what do you think businesses can do to manage the cost of returns to their business? Well, I don't know what you consider to be is it a benchmark, but 30% seems to be the sort of you know, average benchmark people tend to think about. Well, I think I made the point, I tried to make the point a few minutes ago, is that when we all started in our businesses doing what we did, we had a distribution system that only worked one way. You know, the stuff came in off the boat, into the warehouse, from the warehouse, through the shop, from the shop to the customer, and you hopefully never saw the damn thing again. Well, I'm afraid we don't live in that world. Somebody told me, I think I was talking to you, was like about it, that there are some places now where, where, um, where Net-a-Porte will actually either collect the stuff for you or they've got places yep. you can go to. So there's, yep. And what you told me about the one about Volvo? The Volvo, Volvo car boots, yeah. where you can have it delivered. So that's what customers want. But again, it's how do you reverse engineer that in mm. such a way that you can actually not lose your shirt every time you sell something? Because mm. you can't just stick it on the selling price. Mm. But the customer's already said they won't pay for the service. Actually, you know, there are some quite clever things you do because one thing we do know, and those of you who've got online businesses know better than I do. You know, you can be quite smart with the demand. You can, on quiet days, as Tesco actually now are doing, offer some free delivery slots. We do that in a car day. You know, if your Tuesday is pretty quiet and your Friday is damn busy and you say to somebody, look, you're going to pay five pound on a Friday and nothing on a Tuesday, people will change their behavior. So you can be quite smart with the data and that's why the importance of knowing about what is actually happening so that you can sort of twist it to your advantage is important. 
Mm. But you've got to have the stats to do it and you've got to have the technology to be able to do it. Yeah. So do you think retailers are effectively becoming fulfillment companies? Uh, well, uh, no, I don't think that is the case because I think that, you know, it goes back to my point I think I made also, which is, look, we're in business to sell uh, surprise and delight, right, whether it's in food or whether it's in clothing. And it is the biggest hobby we've got and we do all like to go out and treat ourselves. Actually, it only reminds us that what we're really in business for is to come and deliver all the time product, product, product. And I still believe fundamentally, old-fashionedly, that with all the problems that retail faces, which is why I'm optimistic about retail, that if you do serve the product customer with the right product, whether it's innovative foods, whether it's innovative other goods and services, whether it's innovative uh, um, uh, clothing and, and, uh, and uh, fashionable clothing, they will buy it. Yeah. And that's what we want. Yeah. So it's about a differentiator proposition yeah, at the end of the day. exactly. I haven't seen any hands pop up, but if anyone has got any questions, please do raise your hands now before we... The gentleman right at the back with his hand up. Hi there, uh, question for Stuart, um, obviously. Um, where, you talk a lot about collaboration. Where would you draw the line in terms of, you know, how far would you go in terms of collaboration? Well, I, I have to be careful what I say. Well, I don't have to be careful what I say because I don't, I'm not involved in anything, but, you know... <laughs> why do we assume that the status quo has to stay as the status quo? And, you know, we're seeing now an M&A market which has been absolutely dormant for years with everybody frightened about doing everything. Suddenly it's now on, on fire. I think one of the headlines in one of the financial papers this morning says, you know, it's, it's sort of M&A &A mania. And, you know, there are some restrictions about what can and cannot happen in the UK with the, with the competition authorities. But actually, I would urge people now, knowing that these sort of things are about, to go for scale, to understand what is possible. And it doesn't take you very long if you get a piece of paper out. And I think this is what uh, Kate does for a living. She runs strategy at uh, John Lewis. See who, who could do what with whom. And actually, there are still options out there. Right? Now, clearly, you couldn't, you know, let's just take a ridiculous example. You could not merge Tesco and Sainsbury's. Because the competition authority will have like, like a cheap suit. But there are other deals around that you could, could do things on and a, a lower level down. So I think you know, that's something that I would be doing if I was a chief executive, if I'd now got my balance sheet under control, if I'd got through the recession, if I had cash to burn. I'd be saying to myself that, that, that doing nothing is not an option. Standing still is not an option. Therefore, I should think about which way is the world going to move? Is it going to move into online? Is it going to move this way? How do I get that advantage by sucking something up today which will give me that that differentiated advantage tomorrow. And I, I think we will see things, yeah. definitely. Yeah. You know, there'll be a big deal somewhere in retail in the, you know, we've seen a little bit of it in a smaller way. I mean, mm. the House of Fraser's changed hands. Yeah. Right. E -buy buying shuttle. I yeah. thought that was an interesting move. Exactly. So, you yeah. know, the, it, 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 watch this space, it's going to happen, and you should be involved in it yourselves. Yeah. Any other questions from anyone? No, no hands. In which case, Finally, I will ask, what has been your best personal delivery experience and why? Oh, God. Did he ask me about this before? I didn't I prepare for this one. Um, there's no doubt about it you know, that Amazon, when you order a book, and I'm a pretty avid book reader, and I know that if I've ordered that book, so it will come tomorrow. And there's something, that nice delight about, you know, there it is, that lovely hardback book with the clean... I'm, I'm not a Kindle reader. I am an old-fashioned book man. And you can have it immediately on a Kindle. I know, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you really want me to tell you why I hate Kindles, then you tell me. I read a lot of books, like history books. So if I, and you know, because I'm quite busy, I don't get to read them at the pace or the, the, the volume that I like. So I'm always trying to remember what happened. If you want to do this in a book and say what happened with that, who was that, okay, what date was that, or was there a map there? In a Kindle, it's never good, it doesn't matter what the Kindle is, fiddling around, trying to get the thing back on the four pages back. And then if you're on the beach, the sand's on it, then you've got the oil on it, then the bloody glare from the sun's coming on it, then you chuck it away, right? <laughs> Buy books, guys. <laughs> Each to their own. Quite right. On that note, Sir Stuart Rose, thank you very much. Pleasure.